In our last lesson, we reviewed some of the features of the ark itself, how it was built, and more importantly, how the ark was a model or a type or a preview for the church. That was really interesting. A lot of people gave me some feedback saying, hey, how, how fascinating is that? The ark and the church, you know, so many parallels. And we made comparisons between the ark and the church. You know, for example, we said uh, you could only be saved in the ark and, and, and uh, consequently in the New Testament, you can only be saved by being in the church. Uh, there was only one ark. Well, the Bible teaches there's only one church. Uh, there was only one door on the ark through which you could enter or leave. And there's only one door in the church. You know, Jesus said, I am the door. You know, the door is Christ. Um, I have another comparison not mentioned last week. Um, and that is that everyone was invited to come into the ark, but only a few chose to enter the ark. And isn't it the same with the gospel? Everyone's invited to come into the church, but only a few respond to the message of the gospel. Uh, last week we also talked about covenants, which were promises that God made to man about what he was going to do. God made a covenant with Noah concerning the ark, that those who entered it would be saved from the disaster that was about to happen. Basically, that was the covenant. I will save you. Don't worry about the storm. You're going to see something you've never seen. You, you could not even imagine. You think they could have imagined the earth being covered with water? You know, they couldn't even imagine that. But his promise to them was, I'm going to save you through this. And there's also a parallel uh, for the modern church, isn't there? I mean, we're, 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 uh, you know, I hear people say, oh, society's falling apart and you know, everything's going bad and so there are wars and this and that and immorality, things that our parents would have never even thought of. And yet the covenant that God has made with us is exactly the same. If you're in the church, I'm going to see you through whatever disaster takes place here on earth. So another similarity there. All right, so now we're going to go to chapter seven, a little review there that we had, chapter seven. And in this chapter, we see the final preparations for entering the ark before the flood comes. So chapter seven, verse one says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. So if you remember, God said before that He's given 120 years as a kind of a grace period there, you know, wait period, and there's been silence from God for 120 years. He, he said to Noah, this is what you're going to have to do. I'm giving man so much time to repent, and after that, nothing. You know, sometimes we're a little uh, impatient. We ask, for something, we ask God for something on Sunday night, and by Tuesday afternoon, if He hasn't answered our prayer, we're getting a little antsy. And yet here, 120 years later, you know, Noah didn't get any like bulletins from the Lord saying, good, very good, you got that first floor built, way to go, keep going, two more floors, uh-uh. He says, get the ark ready, you've got 120 years, that's it. So there's been silence since God warned Noah about the judgment to come. And since that time, Noah has obeyed God's uh, command without wavering, and at the same time has preached to his generation. So now the silence is broken as the time for judgment is at hand. So the animals are assembled, the last of the patriarchs have died, the ark is ready. And I want you to note that God brings the animals to the ark. Why? Because the animals don't have free will. He just brings them to the ark. But he invites Noah into the ark. Why? Because Noah has free will. Noah can say yes or can say no. God will be with him in the ark to sustain and to protect him. And that is another similarity between the ark and the church. Now the words of God to Noah, I have found thee righteous, also sound the same as when Jesus you know, says, good and faithful servant, you know, every, Christians always say that, I can't wait to hear the Lord say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. And yet God says to, uh, to Noah, I have found thee righteous. Kind of the same thing he's saying to, 
to Noah. And so uh, God says this when He talks about His welcome to those who have been faithful and who have lived in a faithless generation. Uh, Paul and I and Rachel, you know, we were having a talk at home, uh, you know, just talking about stuff and we were just talking about, because we're watching TV and on TV the news and stuff like that and everybody's chasing the dollar and everybody's, you know, who's number one, who's going to win the NBA championship, who's going to do this, who's got the fastest car, you know, stuff goes on at the speed of light. And we were uh, kind of sharing the idea that in this life, it's not about winning and it's not about uh, keeping up with the Joneses, it's not about wealth, it's about faithfulness. The only question that we're going to be asked by the Lord is, were you faithful? Not, did you get the big promotion? Or were you wise with your money? Or did you manage to get your kid into the best school? Or, yeah, yeah, those are not the questions he's going to ask. Were you faithful? Around our house, one of the mantras you know, between the parents, Lise and I, and the kids, was always the idea of reminding them, remember, it's always about faith. Every single day, it's always about faith how you treat other people, how you deal with the world, how you deal with your spouse. You know, it's always about faith. It's always about a demonstration of faith. Every test that God allows you to have in this life is simply testing or building your faith, period. And so uh, this is what happened to Noah, 120 years, all the work, all the sweat, all the humiliation. What was it about? Testing his faith. And so we read in chapter two, verse two, he says, you shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. So here God gives instructions on how to divide and use the animals that he is to take aboard the ark. And so Noah was to make a distinction between clean and unclean. Probably animals that are suitable for domestication from those animals that will be wild animals. Domesticated animals were to outnumber wild animals in order to provide for food and so on and so forth. Also the seventh pair of clean to be used for sacrificial purposes. You know, I, 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 it would be a little difficult if God had chosen wild animals to be used for sacrifice. I mean, then it would be a little tough to find them, hunt them down, so on and so forth. So obviously domesticated animals were to be used for sacrifice. Of course, the overall purpose was to keep the animal kingdom alive. Later, during Moses' time, God will make further distinctions about what is clean and what is unclean. For now, it's just a broad distinction. Let's keep reading. Verse four, it says, For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Hmm. Wouldn't it be nice if we could say that about ourselves? You know, Bob did everything that the Lord commanded him. You know, Tommy did everything that the Lord had commanded him. Paul did, oh no, no, it wouldn't happen there. But anyways. So a final warning with the specifics of what is going to take place. Note that God provides a final week, another week. A final week for last minute preparations and a final call to repentance for those who are still unbelieving and unresponsive. Now they might have scoffed at the beginning of the building of the ark, but now that the animals are boarding, now that the ark is complete and Noah is making a final appeal, the signs were clearly evident that something was going to happen and yet nobody responded. Nobody responded. You know, the Hebrew word here, kol yehu, and of course, you know, I would have had my slide here, but you can see it on the video, um, where he says every living thing. The Hebrew term translated every living thing can also be translated all existence. And this is significant because it refers not only to breathing animals, but to everything that has sentient life. Birds, animals, insects, plants, trees, sentient life of, at one level or another, 
all was to be destroyed. Everything would be gone, everything buried in sediment where thousands of years later scientists would formulate all kinds of fantastic theories about billions of years and evolution and so on and so forth. The Bible says that Noah did not hesitate in the face of this, but he continued to trust God and obey Him. Again, that's the other thing that life is about, trusting and obeying, it's all about that. You demonstrate your faith, how? By trusting and obeying the Lord. Another parallel with the church is that Jesus promises that the world will be destroyed completely and the only way to be saved is to be in Christ, in the church. And there's only one door to enter into the church and that's of course Jesus. And there's only one way to express our faith in Jesus, repentance and baptism, very clear, very you know, sometimes you wonder, it's so simple, why, why do people make this so complicated? Well, if you want an example of that, take a look at what happens when a simple idea is appropriated by the government, for example. <laughs> you want to see something get overcomplicated and difficult? You know? I mean, and I don't just blame the government. Any big organization you know, will take a simple thing and they'll make it complicated, right? Yes, that's why we have guys like Mark here. You know, that's how he earns his living. He's saying, thank goodness companies make things complicated. You know, they call him up to, to clean up the mess after. Okay. All right, let's keep reading verse six. He says, now Noah was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So this is a kind of a summary comment of all that had taken place according to God's plan. Noah's age is given as a, a kind of a historical marker. Where are you going to mark the flood? The order of entry, Noah first, his sons next as heads of families, uh, the wife of Noah, and then the sons' wives, and then the clean animals, the unclean animals, the creeping things. So this is the end, right here, we're reading about the end of the antediluvian age, before the flood. Because once they're in the ark, the judgment comes upon the earth. Now when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ and the faithful all caught up with him in the air, and then the wicked and the world are destroyed. So the same pattern, the same pattern, okay? So this marks the end of the preparations for the flood, the 120 years of grace period. Uh, theologically, that corresponds to the thousand years. You know, you hear about the thousand year reign, and a lot of times you know, you hear about the idea, oh, when the thousand year reign starts in the future. No, wrong. Incorrect. We're in the thousand year reign. The thousand year reign is the period between Christ's, you know, His death and resurrection, establishing the kingdom, and His return. There's the thousand year reign. Not literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and 999, 1000. Not that. You know, biblical numerology, a thousand means a perfect time that only God knows. A perfect time that only God knows. So during the time of Noah, there was 120 years. Not a perfect time, but a time allotted by God for people to repent, to be ready. When Jesus comes, we're in the thousand years. We have a thousand years. We have a, a time period where the church, the people in the ark, are saying to the people in the world, you better get out, this, this thing is going to sink, this thing is going to be on fire. And I often tell people, you know, we're not about saving the environment. We're not about wiping out poverty. We're not about establishing democracy and, and developing countries. We're, you know, that, are those things good? Sure, they're good. But that's not the mission of the church. The mission of the church is to say to the world, get out of the burning house the house is burning around you, get out of there and come on in and save yourselves. That's the work of the church. Now, we can help the poor, why? Because that's a witness that our message is true. 
We can be good stewards of the environment. Why? Because that's a good witness that, that, uh, that uh, confirms our message. We can live righteously because it's pleasing to God, but also because it confirms our message. If I was here telling this to you, and underneath here, instead of a glass of water, I had a glass of scotch, and I had my ashtray over here with my cigarette going, and I was saying, you know, people got to come out of the world, you know, you'd be thinking, I don't know if I believe that guy. Or if I had a big, you know, chaw tobacco in my mouth and I just couldn't talk and I said, excuse me, I got to spit in my cup while I am telling, you know, you would say, you know, it's not the world's worst sin, you know, but we expect a little more from the people who are saying, come out of the world and save yourselves. Don't we? Sure we do. Sure we do. So the 120 year grace period, similar to the thousand year reign where our job, our life, everything, is predicated upon us saying to the world, come out of the world, save yourself, okay? So let's look at the flood itself, verse 10. It says, it came about after the seven days that the water of the flood came upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, and I'll stop there just for a minute, we don't know the dating or the calendar system used at that time. We only know that there was a system and the exact time when the flood came was actually recorded. And why wouldn't it be recorded? I mean, don't we have a record of the tornado that came through more last year or this year? Was it this year or last year? Was it last year? We have a record of that and that was a terrible thing and many people were killed and injured and so on and so forth. But really, I mean, it only covered a a kind of a you know, couple of mile radius, right? But yet we have video records of it and memorials and all kinds of stuff. Here the entire world was destroyed. Don't you think they would have kept a record of that, those people? Of course they would. And so in a verse and a half, in, in, the, um, in the following verse and a half, God explains the incredible natural phenomena that produced the flood. And so we read in 11b, it says here, on the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. The rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you imagine the whole flood is explained in a verse and a half? One and a half verses, incredible. So what's he saying? He's saying the fountains of the great deep in the beginning, you know, when we started studying Genesis, I explained that the earth was irrigated by underground waterways that provided moisture. Genesis chapter one, verse 10, and then again in Genesis two, verse five, they talk about that. And so what's happening here is that these tremendous reservoirs burst through the earth's crust in order to cover the earth. And then he says, the windows of heaven were open, poetic way, I also explained that the waters above the heavens, mentioned in Genesis 1 verse 7, um, what that was, was a water canopy that surrounded the earth. And this water canopy, this water vapor canopy, provided even temperature, uh, moisture, and also protection from harmful rays. That is the pre-diluvian, you know, the anti-diluvian world, the pre-flood world, was a lot different than the world we live in today. So what happens? Well, this water canopy is now dissolved and poured out on the earth as a torrent of rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, you know, if you live in Oklahoma and you've ever seen a rainstorm in Oklahoma, you know how much damage can happen in like six hours, right? Flood, the creeks overflow, and we've seen the damage that has happened, you know, Katrina, for example, things like that. Can you imagine if it was pouring rain for 40 days and 40 nights? Scientists tell us that if all the water in the clouds that are presently over the earth, if they were to suddenly dissolve into rain, the earth, the entire earth would be covered with only one and a half inches of water because there's not enough water up there to, you know, 
what happens usually is that a lot of water falls on a small space. But if you were to take all the water and spread it out over the earth, it, it, it wouldn't cover a lot. So what caused the flood then? Well, if all the water of the world in the earth and the water canopy in the sky were to simultaneously dissolve and cover the earth, this could and did cause a flood that destroyed everything. Some people say, well, what caused it? Some people say, well, a meteor crash caused a, a catastrophe in those days. Or some people say, well, the earth tilted on its axis. Others say aliens did it, you know, whatever. You'd be surprised. You would be surprised how many people believe aliens you know, caused what's going on uh, here on earth. The Bible only describes the natural functions that were released that created the flood, but it doesn't des des describe the natural trigger. You know, why did the water canopy dissolve? Why did the underground uh, 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 waters burst? For? Why did that? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. It only says this is what happened. We know God caused it to happen somehow. I mean, we know that sin, theologically, sin is what made it happen. God, you know. And realistically, we know that, well, it was God's will. But naturally, we don't know exactly what God did or allowed to happen to cause that particular result. So we keep reading in verse 13, it says, on the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him and the Lord closed it behind him. So this is a kind of a final snapshot if you wish a confirmation of those who went in and the time. Not before or after, but exactly when they were supposed to enter. Notice that God is the one who shuts them in. He's the one that seals them into the boat. Again, another parallel with the New Testament. You know, uh, in the New Testament, um, there's a similarity with the church. And the similarity with the church is that God is the one who cleanses us of sin. God is the one who calls us into the church. God is the one who seals us with the Holy, with the Holy Spirit. All right, now the next couple of verses give a description of the flood as being a worldwide catastrophe, a worldwide event. Now in the last century, Science has been in love with the theory of evolution and its position that the earth evolved over billions of years. Of course, this leaves no room for the sudden disaster of a worldwide flood. The flood of the Bible has been explained as a myth or a local flood that has been mythologized into a worldwide event by Bible writers. In other words, there was a local flood in a local area and Bible writers simply extrapolated that that local flood was really a worldwide flood to make it a little more readable, a little more exciting if you wish. But the Bible actually says it was a worldwide event in its description. So let's read 17 and 18. It says, then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. So it would require at least 20 feet of wire, uh, water rather, to lift up a boat the size of the ark. So that's not some local creek bed that's over flooding there. Also the terms above the water or upon the earth refer to the scope of the water. A local flood would be receding after 40 days, not just starting. You know what I'm saying? It rained for 40 days. Verse 19, the water prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Okay, right there, boom. Verse 19, either you accept that or you don't. Either that's what it says or it doesn't. Either the guy who wrote this is just lying or he's telling the truth. There's no way you can kind of, you know, 
you can't make verse 19 into just a local flood. The words selected were purposefully selected to describe a worldwide catastrophic event. All the hills, all the mountains that were there were covered. They were at least 20 feet above the highest peak. Well, Mount Ararat, 17,000 feet, 17, feet, excuse me. These people were eyewitnesses and they were recording their experience in detail. Wouldn't you? It says the water prevailed 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. And so let's read 21. It says, all flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind. Of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. So here's my point. I make this point about Jesus, about other things. You are free, you know, people are free to reject what it says. People are free to say, you know what, I know what it says, but I don't believe it. Okay, fair enough. But what you can't say is that the Bible doesn't actually say there was a worldwide flood. You can't say that. You can say I don't accept it. You can say I don't believe it. You can say I doubt it. Okay, fair enough. But you cannot say, oh, the Bible doesn't really teach that there was a worldwide flood that destroyed everything except Noah and his family and those who were on the ark. You can't say that if you know how to read. <laughs> and usually I found the people who say that, you know, I, I give you a little tip here when you're studying with someone and they make these pronouncements, ask them only one question. Have you actually read Genesis? Well, no, but everybody knows. No, 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 no. Have you actually read the text? Well, no, who needs to read the text? Well, you know, no use arguing that point, okay? So the Bible is very specific, everything, vegetation, insects, birds, animals, all mankind, a local flood would not be described in this way. Only Noah and those with him survived. This also tells us that the ride in the ark did not cause the death of anyone inside. And then the final verse, it says, the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. This does not mean that after 150 days that there was no more water. It would be a year before enough land would be exposed to allow Noah to leave the ark. There was only water that covered everything for 150 days. So for five months, water covered everything. That's what he's saying. Can you imagine the damage caused by such a condition? No wonder everything died. I mean, we've seen what a flood can do, but imagine 150 days, everything's underwater. In addition to the destruction, the rapid destruction and setification of bones, vegetation, and so on and so forth, is what actually created the geological records which are found today, but are misinterpreted by evolutionary scientists. Evolutionary scientists begin with a theory and then they try to match everything to the theory, you know, their preconceived theory. And a lot of times it just it doesn't fit. Okay? So let's summarize here. I think we've got about five minutes left. For now, we have learned not only the details of the flood and the range of its destruction, but the important fact that the biblical flood was a worldwide event, not a local one. So here are a couple of lessons. You know, are there some lessons here for us that we can apply just to our everyday lives? Sure. Lesson number one, God keeps His promises. God keeps His promise. He said He would do it, and He did. Whether it be good or bad, we need to be careful as well as optimistic when we consider God's promises to bless us or to punish us. If He says, I will be with you, He will be with us. If He says, I will never abandon you, and He does, He will never abandon us. But if He says, don't do that, <laughs> or else, you'd be wise not to do that. Okay? Another lesson from this, God requires exact obedience. 
You know, we have the misconception that obedience in the Old Testament was very important, very strict, but in the New Testament, God is you know, more laid back about obedience, you know, whatever. You know, we think that's the God of the New Testament. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that what was written in the Old Testament was for our instruction so that we can take note and learn. The command, for example, to repent and be baptized or to live holy lives and so on and so forth must be exactly obeyed today as His commands were then. It's the same God. He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed at all. So it's, you know, some people say, oh, you people, you're legalistic. You're so careful about doing you know, Bible things in Bible ways. I don't call it legalistic. I call it prudent. You know, uh, uh, I like to uh, go out and fire a gun at the range. You know, I don't do it very, very often, but the times that I've gone, you know, it's fun, you know, just you know, target practice. But you know what? I am so very careful when I handle a firearm, especially since I didn't grow up with those things. You know, I'm not very familiar. I was never in the military. So I have a very, very high degree of respect for those things, especially when I loaded the bullets backwards into the thing once. You know, that was, my son-in-law you know, was shaking his head. He said, okay, Pops, that's good, that's good. Just let me do it. You know? So imagine you're, you're taking such care with an inanimate thing that could you know, kill you if you're not careful. How much care should you take with the living God who could destroy your body and then throw your soul into hell? You know, I think I'd be very careful. I'd be you know, very careful if I were you. And then the third lesson, I want us to be encouraged here, and that is God is with us. For those on the ark, as for those in the church, God is with us to help us and to guard us during our journey. I want us to understand, I want us to understand that God wants us to go to heaven. Are there any parents here that have ever said, you know, the husband said to his wife, man, I sure hope our kids are unhappy. I hope they have terrible marriages and they go through several divorces, you know, and a little cancer around 30 years of age, man, that'd be the icing on, has anybody ever said that about their kids? No. It's, what do we say about our children? We want them to be happy. We don't want them to suffer like, like we suffered. We don't want to learn, we don't want them to learn the hard lessons the hard way like we had to learn many times the lessons the hard way, we want only the best for them. How many of you parents have said to yourselves when your child is sick or in pain, I would take the pain, I'll take the pain, that we love our children so much we wouldn't want them to suffer, not for a moment, we'd take it. So we, who are sinful, selfish, and self-centered, we feel like that about our children. Could you imagine how God, who is perfect and righteous and holy and loving, full of grace, how He feels about us? He wants us to make it. He wants us to be in heaven. He wants everything that's good for us. He's not the bad guy. He's never the bad guy. He's the guy that's on your side. You know, Jesus' name was Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so he'll be on board until the end. We should not be afraid of the flood, no matter what the flood is in our lives, because we're all, we all dealing with the flood in one way or another. Just remember that God is on board for the journey.